Did you happen to notice the amazing statement the elder made in this letter? Did it shock and astound you? I write these things to you, he says, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Your life is eternal. Not the life that comes next. Not the life that will be given to you after you die if you say or do or believe the right things. Your life, right now, is eternal. That doesn't seem right, does it? This life is clearly not eternal. In fact, it is quite finite. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. In fact, that's the problem, isn't it? The ride is great until the sudden stop at the end. And yet, the elder says that our life, the life we already have, the life that we are living right now, is eternal. And this is the proof that he gives, the testimony he offers in support of this outrageous claim. None other than the very word of God made flesh and living among us in the person of Jesus Christ. I read this and I think that maybe the problem is not with my reading ability or my Bible translation or my understanding of eternity, but with my definition of words like yours and mine. My life is finite. I know that I will die someday. But as we've been reading from the Gospel of St. John and the Elder's letter to his community, I think I'm beginning to understand that my life, the biological phenomenon of my consciousness and growth and learning, but also my sense of who I am as a person, isn't actually mine. It's mine in the sense that it's happening to me, that I experience it, but it doesn't belong to me, does it? I didn't work for it, I didn't do anything to deserve it, I'm not on some kind of probation trying to prove my worthiness for it. I came into being completely without my knowledge or consent and I will likely leave my being in exactly the same way. I'm also aware that I'm not unique in this. I am one of eight billion humans living in this world. There were people before me and there will be people after me. I am a member of one among millions of species that call this planet home. I do not exist apart from this system, but as a result of it, when my life ends, It'll return to this system, and the system will continue on. I wonder if that might be a part of what the Elder wants us to understand, what God wants us to understand, that our lives aren't our own, that they belong to God. God creates and sustains life, and because eternal life is of God, and because God is eternal, then life itself is eternal. Maybe like matter or energy, life may change states or forms, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. A cube of ice that melts and evaporates seems to disappear, but the water's still there. It's just changed phase. It makes me think that the way we understand life is too small. And maybe that's why we hold on to it so tightly. If I understand my life as mine, then I alone am responsible for maintaining it, protecting it. I have to keep it safe because it's the only one there is. But if I understand life as something larger than me, something eternal, something that it's a gift freely given, that it's not mine to protect or maintain, well then maybe that understanding changes how I live. What if the point of life, of eternal life, is not to hang on to it, but to let it go? To illustrate what I mean, I'm here in my backyard, surrounded by plants and insects and animals and sometimes dogs barking and leaf blowers going and planes flying overhead. But I'm here in my backyard and I look at this huckleberry bush. And I think about how all these little leaves on it are little solar panels collecting energy from the sun so that this plant can survive and grow. The huckleberry takes that sunlight, light 
an energy which does not belong to it, but which it receives freely from the sun, and it grows these tiny little flowers. These flowers exist for the purpose of giving away that energy that this plant collects from the sun. The plant turns that energy into sugar and it takes some of that sugar and it puts it into the nectar of these flowers to just give away to bees and beetles and butterflies. Those creatures eat that nectar and it gives them life just like the plant takes life from it. And when those creatures collect that nectar, they also collect some of that pollen. And as they visit different huckleberries, they spread that pollen around. And that plant then succeeds in mating with different plants in different areas. In sharing its life, its life is multiplied rather than diminished. Later in the year, this plant is going to create tiny berries. It will pour more of that precious, life-giving sugar into those berries that exist completely to be given away, to be eaten by birds and bears. The seeds in those berries then pass through those birds and those bears and gets dropped on the ground. And if the conditions are right, a new huckleberry plant will sprout up and will start to grow and spread forth its leaves and share its life with the birds and the bees and the bears where it is. And once again, its life in, a, in the sharing is multiplied rather than diminished. This all reminds me of the Easter Vigil when we sing the Exultant, that great liturgical song celebrating the resurrection of Christ symbolized in the lighting of the paschal candle. At one point the song goes, we sing the glories of this pillar of fire, the brightness of which is not diminished even when its light is divided and borrowed. For it is fed by the melting wax which the bees, your servants, have made for the substance of this candle. The light of the candle represents the life of the risen Christ, a life which is shared and yet never diminished because that life is eternal, a truth to which even the bees themselves testify for us with their gift of wax. Even the bees know that life is eternal. In fact, bees know this all too well. One bee may die, but the hive lives on. And so when the bees live, they live entirely for the hive. And so is it the bees who are alive? or the hive. To which does that life truly belong? Now, you may look at me and you say, well, that's all well and good, but we're not bees. We don't live in a hive. Our world doesn't work that way. And you'd be right. That's not the way our world works. But that doesn't mean that the world is right. That does not mean that the way our world works is the only way that any world can work. Two weeks ago, Connie McLeod, a tribal elder and the cultural director for the Puyallup tribe, spoke at our forum. Now, the Puyallup are the people who belong to this land. They lived in this place long before we ever did. And she told us about the way the Puyallup lived before the Europeans arrived. I was particularly struck by her description of trade. Puyallup traders would take long expeditions, traveling by river and sea down the coast, as far away as what's now California, trading for wealth to bring home. But the Puyallup did not measure wealth by what a person had. Instead, wealth was measured by what was given away. When a trader would return after months or even years of one of these trading expeditions, the chief would host a potlatch. Invitations would be sent to neighboring villages, and people would come from far and wide to the potlatch where everything, everything that the trader brought back would be given away. Not sold, not traded, given. That really struck me. Visitors 
from neighboring communities would be sent home with gifts. And the wealth accrued on that trading expedition was shared with everyone. That's a very different world than the only one we've ever known, isn't it? The Puyallup in those days understood that all of our lives are interconnected, that we belong to one another. Without trying to romanticize the pre-colonial existence of the indigenous peoples, their way of life both testified to and was formed and formed within them an awareness of themselves as people and as communities that was greater than just the bodies they inhabited. An awareness that life itself is communal. Such an awareness allows us to hold on to these things less tightly, to let go more easily, because they knew that wealth and relationships and even life itself is no less ours when it's out of our possession. Conversely, letting go of such things may actually be able to help us gain greater awareness of life in its eternity. In the night before his arrest, the night before his execution, Jesus prays that his friends may have his joy in them, made complete in themselves. That's the night of his arrest, the night before he dies. What joy can there possibly be in suffering and death? Well, elsewhere in John's Gospel, Jesus reminds us that he freely lays down his life, that it's not being taken from him, and that because he lays it down, he also has the power to take it up again. He's not just dying. He is sharing his life with his friends. And that act of sharing is his joy. Like the nectar of the flower or the light of the candle, in sharing his life, it's not diminished, but multiplied. To us who are so well acquainted with the joys of holding on and clinging to, Jesus wishes nothing more than to share the joy of letting go, of giving up, of laying down. Maybe that joy is even that in laying down, we find that our life is still ours because it belongs to God. Father Thomas Keating has a poem entitled Out of Nothing. He writes of finding the presence of God in the loss of everything else. To be nothing is to consent to be a simple creature. This is the place of the encounter with I am that I am. When there is no more me, myself, or mine, only I am remains. Then the I may fall away, leaving just the am. When we let go, when everything to which we cling so tightly, our possessions and control, even our sense of I, our sense of self and the ideas and the images and the labels that we use to give ourselves meaning and identity, when all of those things are stripped away, all that remains is the life which is at the very core of our being, the life which is the light of all people, the light which comes from God and returns to God. All that is left when the rest of us is gone is God and God is eternal. I believe that's what the elder is trying to tell us, that this is the joy that Jesus wishes to have made complete in us, that we are who we are only in union with God and with one another. He came to give us the courage to trust this union with God by modeling it for us, by testifying to it with his entire being. This union, the elder writes, is not merely some place that we hope for in the future. The idea of heaven or life after death. It's the place from which we start. It's 
where we come from. It's the place that we're called to live in now. This mystical union among all creatures in the eternity of God means that we don't have to hold so tightly to everything. That, in fact, by letting go, we may actually be able to experience life more fully and more vibrantly than we ever could otherwise. Because we may finally know that life doesn't stop at the tips of our fingers or our toes. That life itself comes from God and returns to God. That it flows in us and through us and beyond us. Knowing that, or at least hoping for it, we might even be able to begin to experience fleeting glimpses of that oneness that comes from knowing that God is our core. I wonder how we might be changed by this mystery. I wonder how our congregation might be changed by it. I wonder what our lives and our life together looks like when we can let go of the joy of holding on to those lives and instead embrace the joy of laying those lives down for one another. To share that life and to experience that it is not diminished, but multiplied. It has implications not just for how we think about death, but for how we treat our neighbors, how we treat our enemies. It changes how we spend our money or where we choose to live or our patterns of consumption and production, what we eat, what we wear, with whom we choose to associate. In short, it affects our entire lives, our entire eternal lives, because those lives are not ours. They belong to God. And because they belong to God, they belong to all of this, to everyone. But most of all, I wonder how the life of one man, killed on a cross, can still give us life all these centuries later. How that life, divided and shared among so many people across so many generations, across time and space, rather than being diminished, has in fact multiplied.